Thanks so much for having me, Dan. I really appreciate being here. Uh, this is a fun topic and a fun group of people to talk about it with. So um, this project is maybe a little bit of an odd one to start off the day because from my point of view, this feels kind of like a beat your head against the wall project where it's like there's something really tricky going on and I just don't get it. And when I say I, I should say I mean we, uh, because this is a project that I've been working on uh, with Artie Rye, a professor at Duke Law School for a few years. We've been working on biologics and biosimilars for a few years. This, this is another aspect of that project. All right, so uh, the real question is, what's going on with intellectual property for manufacturing methods with biologics? Like, what is happening? Uh, and in particular, trade secrecy and patents, how do they interact? Why are firms using some in some instances, some in other instances? How do we make sense of this? Uh, and so I'll start with just a little bit of background because just in case you're not familiar with how biologics are different from regular drugs, this is going to be obnoxiously confusing. Small molecule drugs, we understand them quite well. Typically, we know how to make them, we know how to characterize them. We can say, yep, that's aspirin. It's 100% aspirin and the other stuff in it, not aspirin, and we know what that is too. Like, we're good at that. We're also good at saying, here's how you make aspirin, and look, there it is, it's aspirin. Biologics, much harder to do. Biologics are much bigger, much more complicated. These tend to be proteins made in living cells. If you think about uh, a small molecule drug as being maybe roughly as complex as a bicycle, a biologic is on the order of like an F-16 fighter jet. Way more complicated. But it turns out that it's an F-16 fighter jet that's like made by a team of Oompa Loompas under a shroud of secrecy who do random guesswork half the time. And so making sure that it's always the same F-16 fighter jet turns out to be complicated. And the problem is that the manufacturing process itself involves some idiosyncratic, some stochastic elements where you're saying, you know, okay, we're going to pluck this colony from a plate of bacterial colonies and then we'll grow that up and see if it works. And we don't really know all the things about that bacterial colony. We don't know exactly what's going on with this particular version of the protein. All we know is, okay, now we found something that seems like it works. We can replicably make it in these living cells. We can replicably purify it. We can't quite characterize it. We don't know exactly what it is, but we're pretty good at making it. And so whatever that thing is, we'll take it through the FDA approval process and we got approval for that thing. And so the complication is, well, what if somebody else wants to make that thing? As the FDA says, well, it needs to be pretty close because we don't really get exactly what it is. We don't really get all the details of it. And sometimes if you change those details, bad things happen, like people have strong immunogenic reactions and die, and we don't like that. And so we want you, as a biosimilar applicant, to basically get as close as you possibly can to the original biologic uh, for reasons of safety and making sure that it actually works. And so the question is then, well, how does intellectual property and innovation policy fit into this? And so uh, Artie's and my earlier work on this really focused on the strategy of using trade secrecy to protect manufacturing methods. And the idea is essentially, look, if making a biosimilar is going to require really closely reverse engineering the final product, and that final product, that, that process involves some randomness, some idiosyncrasies, some stochastic things, some things that don't make sense, we'll keep it secret. It's going to be really tough to engineer. Trade secrets is going to be quite powerful. And because you can't vary the final product very much, like reverse engineering is going to be awfully tough, awfully expensive. That should tend to forestall some competitors. So what we expect to see is you know, firms will patent their biologic, they'll patent methods of use, maybe some formulations, and keep their manufacturing methods secret. We talk about why that's a problem. You know, we don't get a lot of competition. And actually, the innovators have an incentive that we never figure out how this works, right? We never actually develop the fundamental knowledge to understand what's going on because that ignorance, that Oompa Loompa secrecy, secrecy shroud, like, actually benefits them in terms of keeping competitors off their back. All right, so this is a story that we told a couple of years ago and I think still bears a lot of truth. But there's more to it than that. Because it turns out that a decent number of biologic companies and a decent number of biologics are protected not just by, say, patents on uh, the product themselves and formulations and methods of use, but also by some patents on manufacturing methods. 
And we think that there's probably some combination, some aspects are kept secret, some things are patented, and we get these ring fencing type things. The, the most famous example of this is Humira, which is a super ultra mega duper blogbuster that sells obscene amounts every year and was uh, approved in 2003. And Humira, AbbVie, the company that makes it, likes to brag, is protected by over 100 patents on the many types of innovation that they have done in developing and improving Humira over the time, including after it was uh, approved, marketed, and launched. Over 100 patents, uh, including things like the drug itself, that patent's expired, formulations, methods of use, and indeed, methods of manufacturing. And Humira is not shy about suing people that want to make generic, or sorry, Abby is not shy about suing people that want to make biosimilar versions of Humira. Okay, so far, so good. We can argue about what's the right balance of patents and trade secrecy and how do we do this. Here's the puzzle that's really bugging us, and I don't have the answer. And it's, by the way, this is entirely possible that this might be one of those presentations where one of you just raises your hand and says, this is the answer, you're just missing it. <laughs> and frankly, that would be super useful. So if you think we're just missing the answer and it's obvious, I would love to know that. Because I've been trying to think about this for a while and I don't quite get it. Okay, so here's the puzzle. There are a bunch of manufacturing patents on Humira in particular. Humira was launched approved and launched in 2003. All of the manufacturing patents were filed between 2006 and 2013, which is to say more than a year after the drug was approved. Now, either these manufacturing patents, these manufacturing methods were used to make Humira at the time it was approved, or they weren't. That's the entire scope of possible things for any individual method. It either was used back in 2003 when it was approved or before then, or it wasn't used back in 2003. Okay, but that's starting point. If it was used back in, or if it were used back in 2003, then even if it was kept totally secret under a case called metallizing engineering, you shouldn't be able to get a patent on that manufacturing method because metallizing engineering says if you use a method commercially, that counts as a public use and will forestall you from getting a patent later on because the method is no longer new. The public has received the benefit of it because of the fact that you used it commercially. So if they used it back in 2003, they shouldn't be able to patent it later on. Okay, the second set of methods. If they didn't use a particular method back in 2003, what is it doing stopping a biosimilar applicant from making a biosimilar? because you don't need it to make Humira, because we know because they made it back in 2003 without using this patented method. Because like they did it, there it was, it got approved. So if I come up with some fancy method for making Humira in 2006, maybe it's a better method, but it's not necessary. It's not necessary to make Humira or something like it, it's just maybe a better alternative. And so if that's the case, that it's totally unclear to me why these patents should be the kind of patents that could prevent a biosimilar applicant from entering the market. Either they're invalid or they're not necessary to actually practice the invention. Yeah? Um, what if they just manufacture it for the purposes of getting FDA approval, which is not necessarily commercialization? I'm not familiar with the case that you said. Yeah, so, so one possible argument of this is like, hey, maybe they have... Uh, a method of making very small batches where it's super expensive and you make a microgram at a time and it'll cost you a bunch of millions of dollars to make any individual batch of the drug. We'll use that for our clinical trials and then all of our scale up methodology happens afterwards. That would be pretty weird um, given that you want to have enough scale up to actually start selling in 2003, which in fact they did, but these patents are still not filed until 2006. I recognize I'm leaning on the facts of this particular case for that exact example. There is, there is some play in the joints here, although I th but I think the basic pattern stands, uh, which is, yes, you can improve manufacturing, but it can't be necessary to actually make the drug that you use these later patented techniques because otherwise you couldn't have gotten approval and you couldn't have launched the drug. Um, now, I'll say two more kind of things riffing on this. One of them is the question, um, 
how does Abby know that people are using these manufacturing methods because everything's secret? This, I think, is an interesting little area of kind of procedural stuff. It's not really the focus of this project, but it's worth thinking about a little bit because, right, if it's not technically necessary to have these manufacturing methods to make the product, then how do you know that your opponent, that your, your competitor is actually using them? Um, one part of it is the BPCIA, the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act, does include an exchange of information where theoretically the biosimilar applicant is supposed to tell the biologic uh, innovator, here's how I'm making my drug. And so you should know if your later patents are being invalidated if they've decided to use your fancy new technology. But not everybody follows that process. Even if you do, eventually you should discover it in discovery. And it turns out there's a, a provision of the patent law, I think section 289, I want to say where patent law recognizes this as an information problem and says, look, if you have a product and there's a patented process involved in making it and it's really tough to see inside someone's Oompa Loompa factory and you don't know if they're actually using your product, you can sue them if you think it's reasonably likely and then we'll do a little burden shifting analysis. So there are ways to get the information there, but it still doesn't answer the essential question. Why, for instance, would, since these patents are all out there, why would Sandoz, if it wants to make a biosimilar, why wouldn't it just use whatever methods were available back in 2003? Why would it use these things that are patented? They're not necessary. And that fundamentally is the thing that's bugging me here. I don't know why these patents are valuable, or as valuable as they are, done to be sure. Part of this is a story of, great, Abby developed a drug, then it figured out better ways to manufacture it. If it can manufacture it cheaper and better and make more high quality versions of it, that's awesome. That's exactly the kind of innovation we'd be happy with. And then compete with biosimilars on the fact that it can make it more cheaply or it can make higher quality versions. Hurrah, innovation, yay, we're very happy with that. But that doesn't seem to be what's happening. It seems to be that these patents are part of a portfolio of patents which is used not just to hold people out from particular methodologies and from competing in the market, but instead through the mechanism of the BPCIA to keep biosimilar competitors off the market at, at all. Uh, and that strikes me as problematic and weird, and I don't quite get why it works. So on that unsatisfying note, I will stop and I look forward to any thoughts or questions that you have. After a round of, yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, yep, that's me. So me I'm Nicholson. Let me, let me exercise the moderator's prerogative and, and, and ask the first question, or maybe a question and a half. Oh, and if I don't know, it's because Artie was supposed to know that. OK, got it. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, so you said this, this is a pattern that seems to appear across uh, not just Humera, but quite a number of uh, biosimilars. Um, the particular example you gave was patents that, that issued 2006 to, I think you said 2013. Mm -hmm. okay. do, do we know anything about the filing dates of the patents that you're talking about? Oh, no, those are the filing dates. Those are the filing dates? Yeah, I believe so, yes. Oh, okay. because, because right, they could have all been filed way back in like the 1990s. Well, so, 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 so that's the question. I mean, so, so if this is still ongoing, this, would, this couldn't be what's happening. But you could imagine a scenario, uh, particularly with the kind of technologies you're talking about, which is really pretty old technology, right? Where I file uh, an application, let's say before 1995, right? Um, so it's 17 years from issue rather than 20 years from filing, right? Um, uh, I, I make those my submarine patents. I keep them down there. Uh, they're kind of lurking in the patent office. Meanwhile, I spin off some CIPs or uh, yeah. uh, you know d descendant patents, and those are the ones that surface you know in 2006 or, or, or the ones that, that you're yeah, aware of. and there's still a submarine patent that's the grandfather lurking back somewhere in the office. Yeah, I don't think this is a submarine patent story. I will I will have to check and make sure, but I'm pretty sure that these are not the pre 1995 patent filings that these are actually much more recent. I believe that those 2006 to 2013 are actually the filing dates, although I, I would not swear to that. Um, but I don't think this is a whole stack of pre-1995, 17 years from issuance submarine patents. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound like an address stack. Yeah. So could the answer come in the form of the patent ticket and the reason why companies get patent tickets 
And so is it possible that the biosimilar is not infringing the patents, but when you have 100 patents and 25 on manufacturing methods, it doesn't matter. Because by the time you litigate it, it's, you've won the ball game. Right, the classic joke, you know, what's well, one bad patent, it's one bad patent, what's well, 100 bad patents, it's a licensing program. And in Hatch-Waxman, you know, if you can keep somebody out, especially if you've got this two-phase litigation in the BBCIA, like phase one, congratulations, you won, now go to mark, market and like half a year before, ask me for all the rest of my patents and let's litigate that for a long time. Like, yes, I think it's entirely possible. It, it would be a fascinating example of we can actually show that all of these patents are totally unnecessary to actually practicing the invention, and yet they end up being really important just because the patent system is so sand in the gearsy um, that you can't actually get past it. I think that's that's possible. It might just be, yeah, these are all bad patents. So what? And, and can, Want to file 100 DJs? Has any of this made it? through discovery or into litigation, because I know that there have been a ton of settlements, all the biosimilars except one have agreed to stay off the market. Has any of this stuff actually been litigated? I don't think any of it's been litigated to judgment. I mean, the problem is, you know, these are the lawsuits that so they get filed, and then you go through the BPCIA procedure, and you do the patent dance, and they say, congratulations, we're going to have a lawsuit over two patents, because you couldn't agree on your list. And then we'll have that. And then before that even gets litigated, now we're going to settle, and congratulations, like, go ahead and enter in Europe so they can have some competition and we'll hang out here for an additional five years without any competition in the US because that sounds cool. Um, so yes, it is entirely possible this is all gaming and all of these patents, everybody knows they're worthless and they just play with them anyway. That might be the answer. That would be a depressing answer, but it might be the answer. Uh, Jake and then Timo. So I, I'd like to suggest a rather simple explanation for this. Right? Yes. And the, the simple explanation is partial disclosure, right? So the original manufacturing method prior to scale up still remains secret. The scale up method is the thing that's patented, but just getting something through the patent office does not necessarily mean that in reality it is enabling for people to actually use it. Of course so not. If you're a biosimilar looking at the situation, you don't know what the original less commercially valuable method of manufacturing is. And even if you're looking at the patents that are filed afterwards about commercial scale up, you still don't know how to, how to make the thing that you want to make. The patents still do not disclose enough information to allow you either to you know, copy it and risk infringement, or even to figure out whether it's worth it to design around things. Now I'll just pause here and I'll do this annoying, like, you know, I have a paper that talks about this plug thing, right? So, so this happens in the vector manufacturing business all the time. God, that place is like a gold rush. Uh, yeah, it is actually. Funny that you should say that. Anyway, um, but yeah, so, so, so this happens in other areas frequently. And my assumption, and having looked at some Yumira patents too, is that this is exactly what's, this is exactly what's happening. So one, one, one possible solution, and now everyone can boo me and throw tomatoes and popcorn and stuff like that, is like, if we're really serious about enabling disclosures and patents, then we should get serious about enabling disclosures and patents, and they should be rendered invalid for that purpose. Uh, so I definitely think you're right that uh, an underlying goal of this, both with trade secrets and patents, is no matter what, we want to make sure that our competitors don't actually know what we're doing and don't actually know what's going on. I think that's incredibly clear across the board. I think that's also hugely problematic. Um, that doesn't, I think, solve the issue of why aren't these later patents either invalid or useless because you can easily move around them. But I, I, I agree with you that I think there's a huge disclosure problem here. You and I disagree as we know, but perhaps the rest of the room doesn't unless you've been following us very closely um, through Facebook. Uh, uh, you know, where is the right place to do that disclosure? I tend to think that FDA is a good place to mandate disclosure of more information. I think you think the patent system is a better place to do it. But I think we're on the same page that, yeah, man, whatever these regimes do, they are not doing a good job of driving disclosure. Timo. Uh, you, you wrote an intriguing, uh, excellent paper in 2016 with Ray on, on the potential of trade secrets to delay biosimilar competition. And um, do you, are you aware of any kind of follow-up studies in delivering? I mean, that's difficult in the trade secrets area, but delivering a little bit more of empirical evidence on this. On this no, I would love to see empirical evidence on this. I suspect we might get a bit of a hint on it later today. Uh, I know Yaniv Helad has done some work on 
biosimilars in the U.S. and saying, look, five years on, we still haven't gotten very many. Scott Gottlieb, on the other hand, tweets about, hey, look, we're getting a bunch. And so whether it's not a lot or a bunch depends, I guess, on your definitions of numbers uh, and what you think the baseline is. It's possible Europe will provide us with a more useful baseline because they seem to have a regime that's a little bit less crazy. Um, but I'm curious to see kind of data on that uh, later today. Could you give us the elevator version of the paper with Artie that yeah, that was the first part I talked about. Right. Th that was what I led my, that, that paper was the paper that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Like, hey, trade secrecy, because regulators define biologics so closely because we have no idea how they work and we're not great at, at figuring out what their attributes are, we're going to demand really close reverse engineering and so trade secrecy is going to be extra, more, extra powerful and extra long lasting because it's coupled with a regulator toggle. Um, it doesn't just make it harder to compete because you can't get close to it. It means that because you can't get almost identically close to it, the regulator won't let you in the market at all. Which I think actually is an overlying theme here, which is that the, the kind of standard innovation dynamics about follow-on innovation, I think, tend to be kind of what are the incentives for firms to improve their products or improve efficiency or do whatever else so that they're slightly better. And then we say, okay, the market's going to be the one that's going to say, is that innovation worth enough so that it's going to shift profits over to you and this will influence how competition works. And that's a pretty standard story and not a, not a problematic story. Like, that's great. Okay, cool. You've got a better version of a widget. And so now you're going to outsell my original widget. Now I have an incentive to improve my original widget. And that whole dynamic really breaks down in the context of uh, markets where we have such defined products and regulators who let products on the market or not. That when what we're talking about is not another antibiotic or another uh, antibody-based drug, but instead a different version of the same drug that FDA can say either yes, you get on the market or no, you don't get on the market. There will be some competition or no competition that that on-off switch functions really, really differently with the idea of protection for follow-on innovation, which I think really ties in with Michael Carrier's work about uh, kind of evergreening and all the patent games that show up in drugs because of this binary switch, um, which ends up mattering a lot more than just like little product innovations. It transforms the power of these patents uh, and makes them, it, it kind of sets them all up to 11. Wouldn't that tend to indicate that Jake's answer is the right answer, though? That, that you know, um, I'm keeping my basic manufacturing process as a trade secret because, as you said, it's so difficult to reverse engineer. Um, and the only thing that I'm patenting is you know, sort of some, some tweaks and some uh, improvements uh, on top of that. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think, the, I think the way the system is set up now, the combination is actually almost exactly backwards, which is to say the fundamental technology that we would like, like everybody to be able to access, here's how you make this thing in one version, like the version that we're sure is effective, that's kept secret and really and, and harder to get to. And then all the little Phillips, the little add-on versions, um, those will get patented, those will be disclosed lousily, but they'll be disclosed. Um, but they end up kind of extending that binary monopoly version rather than just increasing a competitive edge that one company's or another company's version of the same product might have. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I've, I've got one more follow-up on that. Sure. I suggest maybe Jake is right, but it's not a problem. Um, That's a generally true statement. Yeah. So the question would be, What's the licensing posture of these companies? And, and here's the reason I ask that, right? So, I mean, Ed Kitch suggested a long time ago that um, when you're talking about codified knowledge versus tacit mm -hmm. knowledge, right, there's a lot more tacit knowledge out there than there is codified knowledge. For example, the codified knowledge you find in a patent. Right? Sure. Um, so so that, that a business strategy, maybe the best business strategy is, I codify a little bit of knowledge, I put it in a patent, to signal the market what I've got in terms of sure. tacit knowledge, right. which is held in the brains of my engineers. Right? People can look at the patent. They don't actually get anything useful out of that, but they know what I've got back behind uh, you know, closed doors. Uh, so they come and they license the patent, but what they're really licensing is the know-how along with the patent. And the know-how is what I really want the know-how to basically access to the chemists, immunologists, and people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, 
you would have evidence of that if there was certain types of licensing strategies going on in this industry that the patents are kind of a loss leader or a signal rather than the actual product that I want to license. Yeah, so I'll give two quick responses to that unless you wish to weigh in before I give a quick response, Jake. Just one sentence. Yeah, yeah. That Peter Lee's follow-up on tacit knowledge is specifically about manufacturing biologics, right? So this is like that, you know, you do have a case study. Peter Lee has a case study about just that. And the only solution it seems to be is to vertically integrate this stuff because it's like it matters like which like which like reaction ton you're doing PUN you're like doing this stuff in anyway. Yeah, so I think that's so I think this is really important, and I'll, I'll say two small things in answer. The first is I think there's not. I think it would be unusual to expect to see a lot of licensing in this field just because there's so much money that you get from being a monopolist as opposed to a do or triopolist. And so if you like what you really want, and this is this is why Hatch Waxman makes patents so powerful, this is why evergreening is so powerful, this is why pay for delay settlements are were prevalent, and if you believe Robin Feldman are prevalent, uh, is because if you like, it's so much better to keep somebody off the market than it is to let somebody on the market at a disadvantage. It's just so much better in this field, and it's worth so much that we shouldn't expect to see a lot of licensing. Uh, the second point about tacit knowledge is, I, I think it's totally true. There's a ton of tacit knowledge here, and biologic manufacturing is exactly a place where tacit knowledge is really important. One of the things that I think is neat here, and I've written about elsewhere, and Artie Rye and I also wrote about, is. FDA is a cool institution to think about as a locus for disclosure requirements because part of the FDA approval process essentially requires applicants to make explicit as much of their tacit knowledge as they possibly can. Because when you're disclosing to FDA, it's not like a disclosure to the world or a disclosure to a competitor. What you're trying to do is say, hey, person who can break my business and who actually knows what's going on, and who can keep me off the market. I promise I know what I'm doing and I'm gonna do a good job. And here, let me show you all the evidence that I possibly can that I know what I'm doing and I'm gonna do a good job so that you let me make billions of dollars. And that incentive is so huge and so overriding to say, look, I gotta convince the regulator that I think there's a strong incentive to say, no, we're not gonna, leave, we're not gonna keep things secret from FDA to the extent that we can avoid that. We're going to try to codify tacit knowledge because FDA wants this information because it's really important to us that FDA believe we actually know what we're doing. Certainly limits on that, but that for me at least is a reason to think that some sort of disclosure regime tied in with FDA uh, is likely to be more practically significant than a disclosure regime that's tied in with, say, the patent system where, frankly, the patent examiner doesn't care what ton Biologic X20 is made in because, you know, as long as it's a biologic that roughly works, I don't care about the details. Uh, Michael Carrier, and then I think we're out of time. So let me ask you about trade secrets generally in sure. this space. So it seems like when you talk about Hatch-Waxman, the BPCIA, there's a trade-off between innovation and competition that's at the core of these statutes. Mm -hmm. And the innovation part comes from patents and exclusivity. And it doesn't seem like the drafters really had in mind trade secrets added on top of that. And so it seems like they're getting too much, the initial manufacturers, when you have trade secrets to the mix. And so what do you think are the strongest arguments for why trade secret protection is not appropriate here? And Congress cares about drug pricing these days. It's talking about stuff to do. If you were to have Congress do something, what would that look like to limit trade secrecy? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm totally with you. I, I wrote a paper on this, and the paper could, easily, could very easily have been titled Against Double Dipping or against triple dipping, because I think you're exactly right. This is, an, this is a particularly interesting area where the question is, how generalizable is it? I don't know, but it turns out it's a really important area, so who cares? Where we have incredibly explicit negotiated policy bargains. I don't have to say what's the right length of time for patents in this area or whatever. You know, Ben Royan, knock your softs off, do a great job on that, I appreciate it. But like, we have an explicit bargain that says, here's what you get. Like, you develop a drug and you develop the information that's going to show us that it works and that it's effective. In exchange for the first, you get 20 years of patent life plus some little extra thing. In exchange for the second one, we're going to give you seven years or 12 years or whatever it is, depending on the type of drug that you have. Like, Here's the trade-off. It's right there. It's in the statute. And so when you say, oh, just kidding, trade secrecy is going to give us an additional you know, 40 years in the case of Premarin or whatever in the case of a particular biologic, that's something that's not part of the bargain. 
And so I have relatively little sympathy for the standard arguments that say this is going to help us drive innovation because we had that conversation. And if you think the answer is wrong of that conversation, then I'm totally open to claims that we should reopen that conversation and say the term for patents should be different for pharmaceuticals or FDA, 12 years is wrong for biologics for FDA to give or whatever. But don't do it through this weird like trade secrecy might end up tripling the exclusivity time that you effectively have. Uh, and so I'm very sympathetic and indeed have made calls to say this is an area where we really should be promoting lots of mandatory disclosure uh, through FDA mediated mechanisms. Thanks very much. Thank you.